Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today, Gaining Traction with your Sustainability Initiative. We're so very happy to have Matt Mayberry from Whole Works, and he has invited Carrie Maper and Anna Viegas to join him. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Matt, who's the founder and CEO of Whole Works, which is a firm specializing in simulation-based business improvement and leadership development. Matt's work takes a systems-oriented view of business while also drawing on the stakeholder-oriented principles of sustainability to stimulate creative thinking about new products, processes, and business models. Matt received his PhD in physics from MIT and his MBA from Stanford. He's a lecturer at the University of Vermont Grossman School of Business currently. Carrie Maper will also join us, and she's the North American Purchasing Director based in Chicago. And Anna Viegas, her colleague, is a research and development scientist based in Toronto, Canada. And they both work for Griffith Foods. Together, they've completed the leading the sustainability transformation program with Whole Works and are leveraging their functional roles to drive sustainability initiatives throughout the business. So welcome you all. Well, thank you, Holly, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, a special shout out to our friends at Earthshift Global, uh, Lisa, Sam, Karen, Holly, and the entire team. Uh, you've been great partners over the years and really appreciate everything you've done to help us launch this program. And I'm also really pleased to be joined today by Carrie and Anna. Um, they are recent participants of our program. and. Uh, I have to say they're amazing leaders, and I think they have a great story to tell about their, their recent work at Griffith Foods. So thank you, everyone. Um, during the first half of today's talk, I'll present a framework that provides a number of strategies for gaining traction with your sustainability initiative. And then I'll turn the webinar over to Carrie, who will talk about her and Anna's work at Griffith. Before I jump in, let me uh, introduce briefly Whole Works to you. As Holly said, uh, we take a systems approach to change, both on the consulting side of the business where we provide strategic modeling and analytic services and in our leadership development programs. Our flagship program is leading the sustainability transformation, which we've been delivering now for two years. And this is a uh, fully virtual program by design spanning 10 weeks, takes about 10 hours per week. It's a global program. We've had program uh, participants so far from over 20 countries. And we think the program's unique among online leadership programs because it uses a highly immersive simulation to enable participants to learn by doing. And they work in virtual teams, assume roles, make decisions, and lead a realistic transformation of a business over a 20 year time horizon. And they also develop project proposals, which they then take back to their organizations and that gives us visibility into the kinds of real challenges that sustainability leaders face. So I think both Carrie and Anna would probably agree that it's an intensive program, but because it's very realistic and hands-on, it, it really helps you build the kind of competence and confidence and credibility you need to be a, a high impact leader. This program also reflects our beliefs about how transformation to a more sustainable economy will come about. We believe, I think as many of you do, that business will need to play a leading role, but to accelerate change, it can't just be driven by the CEO at the top. Change needs to be driven by leaders at all levels of the organization. And that requires more than technical know-how or even functional expertise or even sustainability expertise. It requires really understanding how business and sustainability can go together hand in hand. And it requires a systems mindset and strong leadership skills. So all that sounds pretty hard, but the good news is that these skills can be developed with practice, and that's what we created LSD to help leaders do. So our goal here is to really transform how sustainable business is taught and to create a model that's highly scalable. So we're, we're change leaders just like all of you are. And as I go through my presentation, if you hear me ever say something like, well, you might think about X, know that we at Whole Works are also working hard to take our own medicine. One of the most important lessons we've learned is the value of building a community. So LST is much more than just a program. We're also building a growing community of sustainability change leaders. And this community includes our program designers, which includes Stuart Hart, 
is a pioneer in the field of sustainability strategy. And our internal team at Whole Works, Laura Asiala, Lauren Frisch, and myself, our advisory council, uh, Dave Stangis, Neil Hawkins, Deidre White. And then we have uh, three LST affiliates that include GreenBiz, Plant Technology Alliance, which is a firm based in China, and the University of Victoria Gustafson School of Business. And of course, a growing number of participants in their organizations, some of which I've shown here. Um, and our community includes many other friends and collaborators such as Earthshift Global, for example. So we're finding that this network is itself a valuable resource to our participants and a source of support that can take different forms like coaching, connections with other leaders, source of advice, links to information, lessons learned, and this will continue to build. But this highlights the first point I'd like to make about gaining traction, which is the importance of growing your network. So find a supportive and connected community to become a part of. The great news is you're already part of one, as part of the Earth, Earthshift Global community. Make the most of it, and as change leaders, we all need all the help we can get, and your network is a critical resource to develop. So leading change is challenging work. Most, if not all of you, have played a critical role at some point in your career where you needed to move an initiative forward. And at times it can feel like this image where you know, you're stuck or you feel like the harder you push, the more you're spinning your wheels. But it also feels amazingly good when you get things moving. So that's what I wanna focus on today is how to start gaining momentum. And before I jump into the content of this session, We'd first like to hear from you about your experiences. So you are all uh, change leaders in that you are helping to advance a project or an initiative in your organization, or perhaps you're an entrepreneur. As you think about your own project or initiative that you're pushing forward, what is a hurdle that you think you'll need to overcome for your initiative to get on track? Or what is a challenge that you believe you'll need to meet in order to gain traction? So if you, if you would, please respond in the chat window. In the next few minutes, we'll circle back to check in on some of your responses in a little bit. And if you would, please share your chat with everyone so that we can all see the list as it, as it grows here. So again, what is a hurdle that you must overcome, you believe, to get your, your, your initiative on track? The STAR model is a framework created by Jay Galbraith that we introduce to our LSD participants pretty late in the program when they're starting to think very practically about how they'll get things done within their organization. And what we're showing here is an adapted version of Galbraith's original model. It covers five different areas that are important to consider if you wanna gain traction with your project. I'll go through these next, and to make it a little bit interesting, I'll present you with a brief vignette uh, about each, each one, a little situation where a leader faces a common challenge, and I'll then suggest which element of the model might be applied to that situation. So let's start with Jamie. Jamie here is a purchasing manager who's frustrated because his senior management isn't providing support for his base of the pyramid initiative. And this is something he's doing to um, try to address the needs of the poorest members of local communities. And his leaders don't see how his initiative will benefit the core business strategy, especially in the near term. And they worry that the payback will take years to realize. So while there are several points on the STAR model here, several strategies that he might consider, I think the one that most applies in this case is probably strategy. This is about formulating a strategy for your project or initiative that makes sense to your organization. This requires that you take some time and understand your organization's current reality and its vision for the future. And ultimately you need to connect what you're doing to your organization's strategy to gain support. You can't do this alone or at your desk so much. You need to engage key stakeholders inside and outside the organization to gain their perspectives. And when you engage with them, it's really helpful to see and connect rather than push your own agenda. So ask a lot of questions. Determine how your project connects or aligns with the business. Find a way to connect to your company's business model or an existing goal or objective or perhaps a risk that at least one senior leader cares about. And 
most often you'll get the attention of a senior leader by finding a way to make your business more profitable or competitive. Now, there are many ways to make a compelling business case. You might consider things like reducing costs, increasing revenues, building a brand, ensuring a reliable supply, attracting top talent, reducing risks, and so forth. How will your project impact the objective of a key leader? And what can you do early on to maximize the return and impact of your effort? So to have more influence and gain support, Jamie here may need to step back and consider not only the social and environmental benefits of what he's proposing, but also the business benefits in ways that'll resonate with his leaders. James here, not, not to be confused with Jamie, even though they have similar names and beards. Uh, James is an engineering manager attempting to lead a diversity and inclusion initiative. And now while he has great technical skills and is an independent worker, in this situation, he's running into a new challenge that requires working across functional areas. And this requires some skills and influence that extend beyond his expertise. So James might benefit from applying the people element of the STAR model. James Collins, uh, Jim's call, everybody's named James in this webinar. Jim Collins, who is the author of Good to Great, once wrote, get the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and the right people in the right seats, and then figure out where to drive it. So one of the first things we ask our LST participants to do, even before they finalize their project idea, is to figure out their dream team. So you might start by assessing your own strengths and development areas, and then look for people who can complement your strengths and fill in the needed gaps whether those be in areas like finance or marketing or engineering, operations, logistics, communications, and so forth. You'll also need a sponsor. This could be a senior leader, someone with position, authority, or access to resources. And when you get pushback, you need someone in the organization who can provide you with cover. So if you're pursuing an entrepreneurial venture, you'll likely need a funder. That could be an impact investor or a grantor. And you'll also need some sort of coach. You'll need to help, help you think through the resources that you require. So you can't lead change on your own. Who you choose to team up with is a critical factor in gaining traction. And you also want to think beyond your immediate team. Think in terms of building a coalition of supporters across your organization who can help you get the help you need to build momentum. So leading change is a team sport. Next, we have Lisa. Lisa is an NGO manager who's leading a project to develop new methods for regenerative agriculture that reduce carbon emissions. She'll need to work with local farmers, but that requires the cooperation of local country leaders in her NGO. And unfortunately, their competing priorities and the current distribution of power and authority are slowing her progress. So she's having trouble engaging the local farmers needed for her project to gain traction. Lisa might benefit from thinking about the structure element around structure. Uh, this refers to the distribution of power and authority. How, how should your project or initiative be structured within your organization? Or if this is a new organization, how will you determine power and authority? In other words, who gets to call the shots? Who makes final decisions? Power might seem like a dirty word. Um, it's really not. Your skillful use of power is really essential, especially when you're pushing to make changes without direct authority. Consider forming a steering committee or perhaps an advisory council to solicit input, add legitimacy, get official approval of the decisions that you make on your team. Such a committee can also give you the access you need to resources. So use your influence to recruit senior members that you need. And you can also observe your own organ organization to see what other kind of possible structures might be helpful. So these might include things like a task force or becoming part of a professional development experience or connecting to a policy committee. Dave Stangus makes this point in his book, 21st Century Corporate Citizenship. He says there, no matter where you are on your corporate citizenship agenda, you have to consider and build into your strategy a governance system to drive accountability and decision-making to integrate sustainability into business operations. 
So Lisa is going to need here to use her influence skills and sources of informal power and authority and find a way to change how priorities are set with the country leaders. And then she'll likely find it easier to engage the local farmers. And here we have Rajiv. Rajiv is a product manager and he's leading the development of a new line of athletic footwear made from sustainably sourced fiber. And this project requires working with suppliers across a global supply chain. And so far, Rajiv's attempts to coordinate decision making have proven frustrating uh, with virtual meetings that are unproductive, failing to produce action. And to Rajiv, it feels like the team has just been stuck in the forming and storming stages for months. So unless Rajiv can help his team become more effective, they're unlikely to make significant progress on developing a new line of footwear. This is about processes. And when we think about processes, we normally think of business processes such as procurement, hiring, developing products, and so forth. But process thinking is just as important for getting things done as a team. And this may require going back to basics, establishing a clear team charter or covenant in order to clarify roles, expectations, objectives, success measures, timeframes, and so forth. This will also make it clear to your sponsors what you are setting out to do and how you will determine whether or not you are successful. So processes also includes being clear on your team about how you will collaborate. What platform will you use, for example, to communicate and share information, especially if you're working virtually? How will you make decisions as a team? What are the lines of responsibility? What methods will you use to ensure that Things you agree upon to do actually get done. What are norms for communicating within the team and externally and so forth. So all of these are important things for making, making sure that you get actual work done. In addition, it's important to ensure that your team's outputs match the inputs of other teams and existing processes in your organization. So for in other words, how does your initiative link to other core processes and what can you do to embed your initiative in them somehow? So Rajiv may be frustrated, but there are clearly things he can do here to help his global supply chain gain traction. And finally, Gina. Gina is an asset manager for an investment firm. And she's leading the way in pushing her firm to develop a new impact investment fund focused on the environment. She's proposed to her boss that she spend 20% of her time meeting with social entrepreneurs because she's trying to better understand their needs but her boss is resistant because he thinks this is going to divert attention away from their bread and butter portfolio. So this is still a fairly traditional firm that rewards partners for financial performance, and he doesn't want to jeopardize his annual bonus. While this situation could indicate a power dynamic at play, the fact that Gina's boss here doesn't want to jeopardize his annual bonus indicates a conflict for him around rewards. So in leading change, you'll likely bump up against people who are rewarded for defending the status quo and for doing what they are currently doing. You may not have financial incentives to offer, but that doesn't mean you can't influence them. It does mean you'll need to find some different ways to influence them. So consider the question, what's in it for me, but from their point of view. This is important not just for influencing your boss, but for attracting team members and stakeholders, executives to gain their support. And consider other meaningful rewards besides money. Rewards like fulfilling purpose, addressing an important challenge, leaving a legacy, uh, gaining experience. Maybe you can help someone get a promotion, gain visibility, inclusion, and so forth. Finally, never underestimate the power of a a sincere thank you. Creating the right metrics for your initiative is also another important aspect of rewards. So look, try to look for metrics that measure progress, but that also enable others in your organization to win. Sometimes this requires connecting the dots between what you measure internally with your team and what you measure for progress in the business and do this in a way where you can help others declare a win. So if Gina here can figure out a way that her proposal creates a win for her boss, she'll have a much better chance of gaining traction. So I hope you see how the five elements here, the star model interconnect. There's a lot of close relationships between them. This is a system. And for it to work, you really need to attend to all five elements together. You may also be thinking at this point that this is really hard work. And you're right, it is. None of these strategies is easy but nobody said that leading change is easy either. 
Um, but the good news is if you can consider these elements and tilt the playing field in your favor, you're much more likely to gain traction. So at this point, I'd like to circle back to our uh, question that we posed and, um, and see what folks uh, came up with. And I'm not seeing my chat window on my screen, so I may need a little help from you, Holly, to, uh, to see if there have been any entries on our list of what are, what are some barriers or hurdles that people have identified that they need to overcome? Okay, well, first one is um, bandwidth, having the time and resources to accomplish. The second is connecting the sustainability goal to the day-to-day -day activities and short-term business needs. Third is approval from senior leadership. Uh, another is putting together an efficient project team. Another is realization of when to engage. Another is identifying what sustainability means to the organization. Another is a lack of understanding of sustainability on the part of senior level members of the organization. Another is understanding what needs to be done and what is the best order to do it and communicating that to the company in order to align it well with the other goals in the company. Well, these are great, Holly. These are, these are, these are amazing. Well, go back to that We've first one. We've got three more went. after that. Oh, all right. Finish them off. Go ahead. Convincing the executive team that there's a strong business case for the initiative. Mm -hmm. Another, focusing and pacing. There's a passion behind these initiatives and our sales folks want to build customer need, but we need to make sure we're selling consistent and accurate information about what we do now and what we plan to do and how we'll do it. Another is inconsistent customer sustainability metrics and focus. And, okay. Yeah, for now. great list. What was the first one again, if, if it's easy there, handy? These are, by the way, I, from, as I'm listening to these, I'm hearing connections with the various points around this, yeah. this model in various ways. I'm also hearing a lot about, you know, the challenges of trade-offs, you know, and, and prioritizing all that. So this is really good. And I hope some of you will pose those questions again when we get to the Q&A part, because I think this is so, really good. So um, bandwidth. Um, bandwidth, yeah. So let's, I mean, we just take bandwidth just for a second. That's a, that's a big one, right? Because often you're asked to do something, you know, that might take 20 or 30% of your time on top of everything else. So that, that almost brings all of these things into play, as, as you can imagine. Um, a lot of this is about, you know, open communication and influencing the, the set of priorities and so forth. And that's not, that's not easy to do. But again, the more you can make the business case and connect to the, the core of your business and the strategy, the, I think the easier some of those conversations are. So we'll come back to all this. Thank you so much for the list of those things. I mean, those sound just great. Um, let me do one more quick thing before I turn it over to Carrie here. And that's just, um, I'm going to plead guilty for a little false advertising. <laughs> um, I was going to spend a little time on this case study about Lipton Tea because it's really a good one. It's a story about a mid-level mid manager who really leads a pretty significant transformation of the Lipton Tea brand um, to a sustainable brand. Um, but that was before I was fortunate enough to get Carrie and Anna to join me today. And I'd love to, I'd rather spend the time with them since I think they have a very real and, and present story to tell. And so um, I encourage you to read the references there that you can, you can get the gist of the story and it does apply some of the elements of the model. But really, right now, I'd love to turn things over to Carrie, and uh, she'll describe some of her experiences at Griffith Foods. So Carrie, take it away. Great. Thanks, Matt. Super excited to uh, share this experience with everyone who's joined today. I was, saw all the comments, which is really fun to read through. And uh, it was creating a little bit of like, oh, yeah, 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 we, we were there too. Oh, yeah, that happened. Yeah, we've, we've been through that. So um, I think if there's one thing that you take away from today, no, you are certainly not alone, but the courage to be a leader in your organization is certainly appreciated. Uh, I know it's not always easy to challenge. So I'm super excited to, to share the learnings that Anna and I have experienced um, working together. And so Anna, you can see her on video now. Just a quick reminder. So we are cross-functional co-workers. We're cross-unit co-workers where I'm in our US unit and she's in our Canadian unit. Uh, but it certainly has not stopped us from collaborating um, 
through the organization which we work, which is Griffith Foods. For those of you unfamiliar with Griffith Foods, we pulled together just a quick description, but really to talk about leading the sustainability transformation in our organization, know that our inspiration really came from if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? And you're by all means more than welcome to debate yes or no's in the chat box. Um, but for us, that really meant if we don't track sustainability, if we don't progress in sustainability, can we really nourish the world, which is our purpose at Griffith? So um, we really took that and then built it into what became our project charter. Matt, if you can go to the next slide. So a little bit about the culture as we were approaching our project at Griffith. You can see on the left is our house and the house is a framework that we also learned through the leading the sustainability transformation and and Matt's wonderful program through Holeworks. Um, but it's something that's very true and in every presentation uh, at Griffith Foods. So this just goes to show the foundation that we stand on the things that we encourage and represent um, and what we're driving to right our vision and our purpose. So a couple of things that you'll notice right away. At the very top, we talk constantly about, you know, blending care and creativity, nourishing the world, right? A lot of that comes from sustainably sourcing materials, having talent that is um, rewarded and incentivized and celebrated, and making sure that throughout the whole organization, the decisions that we're making are sustainable. So again, at the very top of our organization, sustainability is loud and clear that it is core to our purpose. We also have invested vertically into our sourcing strategy to just further drive impact in how we can be sustainable for our growth. So I really want to echo it because I see a couple of the challenges where gaining kind of buy-in at the top, right? And I will say that's one of the challenges we did not have to face at Griffith, but certainly have experience of that in other worlds. So um, we had almost a reverse situation. So what you'll notice though is there's always opportunities and for us what we really found is while we have that really strong buy-in at the top and you know a corporate sustainability officer um we were struggling to really understand how to drive sustainability forward there's not a scorecard we're a privately held organization so there's nothing that we publish every year so while we know it's important not everyone knows how to act on it or even how to define it which is uh consistent with the comments we had so um, I think that, you know, this is where we can start to relate to some of the things that, that you guys bring as well. So here's what we proposed. We took the star model and we essentially proposed that we were going to build a dashboard. <sighs> I'm not sustainability by trade, right? I'm, I'm a buyer. Um, and so for me, and Anna is a brilliant food scientist, but she's not, you know, a financial analyst or someone who's running numbers constantly. It really came down to, for us, trying to, trying to start with the information that we could impact in our functional roles. So from the strategy element, we had that really big buy-in, right? We knew we had leadership engagement in helping define sustainability and drive it forward. We knew that. It's part of our purpose. But when we went to structure, that's where we really found the gap. We found that both of us, certainly across the unit, but equally those that we were working with were really uh, lacking the clarity on how to drive sustainability through the organization, right? So there was this almost pull from throughout the organization up to the top executives to say, but what does this mean? How do I do it? Um, and that's for me where structure really came from. A lot of times structure can show up in a space where it's, you know, who's the decision maker? And so Anna and I decided, why not us? Yeah, maybe bold, but um, you know, we wanna see progress. This is something we're passionate about. So we decided to do things that we have the power to influence and to take on that space ourselves. So the process, <laughs> given that we just promoted ourselves to decision makers, we decided to make it as easy as possible to get buy-in throughout the organization. So one of the things we did is we looked across the group and found a dashboard that was measuring other impacts that were important to the business. For us, it's health and nutrition. So we took that dashboard and we essentially copied the framework of it. We found that by having something that's you know, new, such as defined sustainability targets, it made it a lot easier to gain buy-in 
when it wasn't also something new for everyone to try and digest or read for the first time. So by sharing some of that framework and how that measurement was broken down, we were able to gain a lot of momentum to basically say replicate this process, but with the different numbers. Um, and then people knew exactly what they were looking for. It was a format they were comfortable with, even though the data was new and slightly uncomfortable. From a rewards standpoint, this is really, for us, the foundation, right? This was the part that we wanted more than anything else. We just wanted to know where we stood and where we could get it to be. So one of the reasons Anna and I initially partnered is, you know, I have influence on how we source our materials and Anna has influence on how we use our materials. And so if we knew how to be more sustainable in those realms, the two of us, even just within our functions, could make a lot of progress by a sourcing more sustainable materials and Anna knowing which materials to use and prioritize over other materials to make our blends more sustainable for our customers. So again, for me, it was really about just finding the things that we can measure and starting to gain that baseline data. We have a long way to go. No doubt about it. We have a long way to go, but we had to just discover where we stood today. And that comes from metrics. It really has to be that data-led conversation. And the last bit is people, uh, the team behind us. So what can I say? Uh, small but mighty. And I think uh, one of the things I like to think of is I know we got that great quote about getting the right people on the bus, but I think it's really important to also acknowledge the bus has bus stops, right? There's moments where people will come on and off the bus and that's okay because I'm sure bandwidth was brought up as a challenge, right? We all have big roles to do in our organizations. We have a day job, not just a sustainability job, right? So we know it can be a challenge to get people really bought into another plus one activity. Um, but for us, that's where we really tried to leverage and pull in people that we knew had skill sets when we needed that skill set and then let them go back to their day job once their skill set was adequately provided to our project, once we were selfishly done with them. Um, but I think that there is something to be said around minimizing the contributions that others needed to make to this process really helped us get the short but strong engagement uh, that we need from them. Okay, so you would think, drum roll, this next slide would show you this amazing dashboard and we'd have all of this amazing development that we've done and, and progress and sustainability. But the reality is, we don't have a dashboard yet. This is still in progress. I know, that kind of feels like a fraud. But that's part of the journey, right? I think that's what we're all going through. You have these amazing ideas and sometimes it's just hard to get it done. It's not going to happen overnight. So here's our playbook of how we stay motivated, even in days that we maybe don't make progress on this initiative. The first is to leverage momentum. As we mentioned, we aligned our dashboard to be built in the framework of others. Find spaces in your organization that have buy-in, that have engagement and, and have uh, a sense of security for people, right? Change, we've all gone through a lot of change in the last year, it's not easy. This is the same regard. And there's a lot of pressure for us to do the right things in the sustainability world. So there may be some nerves around, is this enough? Is this too little? Shamelessly steal what's been built and what works for your organization. The second part was sometimes it's forging a path and sometimes it's building an army. Uh, there's been many conversations both Anna and I have had in our organization, which we find people incredibly passionate about sustainability that want to join just to see how we can make more pro progress, right? That's fantastic. It's going to take all of us. It's going to take a cultural shift to continue to drive this as a core strategic objective for organizations. But sometimes you just have to move forward, right? And there's going to be people who just say, I don't have time for this. Okay then recognize what we needed their skills for, recognize the role that they played in your team and see if there's other alternatives you can pull in. And don't be shy, right? When you have that army, maybe one of them can help convince. The passion is so contagious. So bring it forward. Don't be shy about, you know, talking personally around why this is important to you. And the last thing for both Anna and I was really about starting with where we are. 
we have so much work to do, all of us. Uh, every organization has work to do on sustainability. But if we really sat down and said, how are we going to change the world? It's a conversation we would never stop having. And for us, it meant we just have to start somewhere. Let's start in spaces that we know we can help define. Let's start in the spaces that we know once we have measurements, we can make progress against. We know how to do the our functional roles well. So how do we make progress in that space? And then again, going back to the other point, that's contagious. When you start to see success, then it's easier to grow from that baseline. But we needed to just find a way to start. It's not gonna be perfect. You're allowed to change your mind later. You're allowed to build it out or trim it down. Um, but I think the most important thing you can do is to gain some of that momentum and, and show progress and show the tactical execution on some of this because that will then further drive the engagement from leadership. It will further build that business case um, that some of you may be having a challenging time with, with the idea of it. Um, so for, the, for us, this is really where, it's, where we've been able to make the most progress. But like I said, we're not done. So we still look at this playbook all the time. We keep pulling these levers. Uh, we keep getting more and more engagement from the team. Um, and slowly but surely, we'll get there. And then we'll have this really awesome dashboard that we'll come back and share with you. And then we'll tell you how we're going to now make it even higher scores and bigger targets and global and, you know, the rest of the sustainability takeover that we all want to do. But at least for now, know that when we're trying to change, especially in sustainability within an organization, if it's not well-defined, this is, these are our shortcuts. This is how we really leverage the STAR model to bring it to life. Well, thanks, Carrie. That was, that was great. And I, re I really appreciate so much the, you know, the real perspective you bring to this, you and Anna and your work, and you're doing such great work. So thanks for sharing that. And I, I also really appreciate your honesty about where you are and, and, and the challenges. So, so thank you so much. With that, Holly, I think we're ready to, to take questions. Okay. And I, invite, well, I also invite Anna to join in the fun with, uh, you know, if some questions seem appropriate, and we'll, we'll do our best here. People are still welcome to send those questions to me privately. Uh, but the first question is, can you talk about if a scorecard was designed and used for Griffith's food? Great question, Roxana. So thanks for asking. Right now, that's what we're in the process of doing, right? And I'm going to be very honest. The scorecard that we're looking at is in regards to essentially raw material sustainability, because that's the space that Anna and I really influence within our organization. There's a lot of work to do around water and carbon emissions and you know many 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 elements of sustainability that we could continue to influence but what we've decided to do is start with building the scorecard in the space that we lead from and then from there hope to gain the traction and the momentum to build it into a bigger sustainability objective and is there anything you wanted to add to that Yes, and thank you, Roxana, for the question. One thing I think it's really important uh, to emphasize is what we are looking at from the realm of why we, what we can influence in terms of which raw materials we bring in and how they, we use them in our products. It comes straight from our day to day, right? That's uh, exactly our biggest sphere of influence in the company is how do I use the products that Carrie brings in? How can I show my, odd, my, my counterparts both uh, in Canada and across the globe? How can we, what are the benefits for us to be using this sustainable raw material versus the non-sustainable raw material, right? Uh, and then uh, the next step is building that convincing our sales, our marketing team of how can we communicate this to make this a better case ahead. But the scorecard that we are, that I have envisioned in my head comes from the, and Carrie mentioned it, from our previous and still continuing work in trying to track our portfolio transformation to health and nutritious products. And we've started taking the baseline of that in 2016, 2017, and we are just now having a, a working on making that not an Excel spreadsheet that you actually have to manually input and trying to put that in our systems. So as you can see, the previous work, which we're inspiring, uh, inspired on to do, 
is this still ongoing and is this like it's in a, a third, fourth year going in. So we want to make sure that we just add in the end uh, portfolio transformation to health, um, to health, nutrition and sustainable. But we are not even finished with the first two portions yet. We're still working to get to the far, last part. So that's why we don't have anything structured yet to share. We are just seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, how we are leveraging all this movement and trying to jump on that bus. Okay, there's just a follow-up question for that, which is um, what are the main milestones that show things are moving forward and what is the expected timelines for each of them? This is a wonderful question because, um, you know, what's great about being the leader of a transformation in your organization is you get to define this. I think initially Anna and I were like, there's no reason we can't have it by the end of the week. Um, yeah, quickly our day jobs reminded us of that. So I think, you know, when it comes to this, give yourself some grace. Know that it's not just up to your calendar, but up to the entire team. And it does take that full team. Um, so we've tried to be very kind and, and mark our timelines more by milestone. So the first one is obviously having the dashboard. The second one is continuously and expanding the, the database and the data behind it to keep it refreshed. The third one is setting new targets and gaining further engagement and rolling it out globally and all the rest, right? So there's a lot of plus, but what we've tried to do is keep it very, what's the immediate, what's the short term that we wanna gain in a month or three months? And then what's beyond that? Because as we know, businesses could drastically change. Um, and so we've been trying to say, What's this immediate focus that our team needs to have, right? And let's not get so lost in the vision of the potential that we lose the momentum of today. And then from a timeline, from really how do you set expectations on people? I think it depends. It depends on who your team is and how your structure is, right? So if you have people that are really dedicated to this and, and should be held accountable, by all means, hold the accountability. If you have, like Anna and I have, friends that you're bribing on the side uh, with pizza and whatever else to quickly do this work for you, um, you know, be, be patient with them. There's going to be projects that come up that they have to do and know that um, they'll work on this, you know, depending on your friendship, I suppose, but they'll work on this when they can. Um, and that's okay too, right? So we just constantly do check-ins. Anna and I do check-ins twice a month just to make sure that we have, we're keeping the excitement, we're keeping contact with the team, you know, we're giving each other updates on what's coming next, what are the next immediate actions to stay focused on, and not letting ourselves get lost in the big picture. Okay, um, shifting a little bit away from the ladies to back to Matt, can you really still make progress if the senior leaders of your organization seem to be focused on near-term profits rather than long-term social or environmental impact? And what if you don't have a senior leader like the CEO of Griffith Foods? Yeah, which is probably in most often the case, right? So this is, this is a challenge and something we hear, you know, quite often. But there's, um, especially in, in larger organizations, there are many, many ways that you can make progress. And, you know, for the, often, often the evolution of these things is that you have to show progress before people really begin to understand and are able to see what sustainable business even means. So this means making it, you know, vis visible and tangible, even in your own part of the world, and somehow showing that when you do something that benefits the environment or it has social benefits, that it actually helps the business. And that's when, you, that's when you'll get the attention of the senior leaders. So, you know, look for, again, for those opportunities where what you're doing connects to things like, you know, reducing costs or generating revenue or building the brand and so forth, and then achieve, achieve a real result and show those benefits. And this brings up another, um, another idea that we didn't really go into here, which is the importance of prototypes and, and the importance of making, making results tangible and visible as quickly and, and easily as you, as you can. Um, you know, it's easy to kind of get caught in sort of designing the ultimate transformational um, initiative that reaches all parts of the organization and takes years to accomplish. But you'll probably get farther if you can think of something you can do in a matter of weeks or months or even days um, that can actually just demonstrate a very 
con you know, very small, concrete example of, of what you're talking about. And uh, then I think you'll start to get people's attention and then you can build from, build from that. Thank you. Well, and you've had a lot of positive feedback about your webinar so far. But uh, another question is, which comes first, the team or the project? It's not clear that you can form the right team without clear objectives in mind. And similarly, how do you define good project objectives without the right team to do so? Right. That, that's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem, right? The, the team helps you define the, the problem or the challenge or, or, or what you're taking on. So that's why, you know, Colin says, get the right people on the bus, because you bring together a diverse group that thinks about things in different ways and new ideas are going to emerge and you're going to, you're going to come up with things that none of you would have come up with individually. So that, that gets, you know, the, the thoughts going and the train moving, but, but as you are working together, you know, you're also going to, you know, define, define your destiny as you sort of go along. And so it, it's really both and, right? The team, the team can come first, but the team defines the projects and then the project defines the team. You may pull in additional people, you may pull in additional resources. You're gonna have to learn and adapt. It's not static as Carrie has pointed out, some people come and go. And I think, I think maybe that's another real important point. And I think something that Carrie and Anna have have touched on here is the ability to adapt and learn along the way. Just know that you're never going to figure it out up front. And you know the value of getting that team, that initial team, is you have other people with you to begin, you know, to help you work through that adaptive process. But that doesn't mean that the team ends there. So keep keep adapting and adjusting, and and um, you know that's and and you'll make progress. Take small steps, lots of small steps. Okay, I have a question from a consultant who says, what are your suggestions from those of us coming from the outside to affect change successfully? Yeah, that's, that's a challenge um, for any consultant, and I'm a consultant, so that, that's, uh, you know, something I run into a lot. You know, it really helps to have a, a client somewhere in the organization that, that can serve as a, a bridge uh, between you know, what you may be bringing in that is almost like a foreign language or a foreign concept versus their internal perspective where they really understand the internal, um, you know, machinery, politics, relationships, the organizational challenges, all the nitty gritty of that star model. You really have to have that friend inside the organization to kind of help you navigate some of that. So it really is a partnership, um, I think. And, um, you know, the best the best consulting gigs I've ever had are the ones where I have those partners internally who are struggling themselves to bring about change. They need help from the outside to bring in the fresh perspective, but you know, they also are just really good at um, you know, working the channels and um, you know, persisting and getting the right people on the bus and all, all of those sorts of things. So it's a, it's a partnership. Speaking of people on the bus, there's a question about how do you get someone off the bus that you don't want on your bus? <laughs> I'm going to let Carrie take that one or Anna. <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, I think, you know, listen, let anyone who has passion, there's a space for them, right? It's just making sure that you leverage their capabilities and their space appropriately. Um, so don't be shy to break out into focus groups. That's a great tool to make little subsets and give them very clear, very managed time. Um, don't be shy to thank them for their service and celebrate them so that they can move along, right? Um, I think there's a couple of different tools. And, and I would say just, just be conscious not to lose their engagement because it really will take the full army. And uh, many times, too, is just Maybe they are great in the bus, not just seated in the best seat for them. And that's mm -hmm. where, um, you know, try a different thing, try a different approach, the focus groups or rotation of tasks mm -hmm. might be something that will benefit uh, everyone because you might find that you have not just the one person who is giving you grief, but someone else who could have much more potential in another function or in another task uh, could really benefit from rotating roles or experimenting with different uh, partnerships throughout the project. 
good point. Um, Carrie and Anna, as you develop your dashboard, how will you deploy new metrics in a way that gains the buy-in of your organization? And is there an approval process you need to go through or a steering committee? Yeah, of course. There's a whole leadership team uh, at some point that's going to want to see not only this, but progress against it, right? Um, I think for us, what we're starting with is, again, where we stand today. So it's the, it's the influence and the sphere of influence that we have, and then, and then mapping out how we can grow that from there. And I'm going to throw it to you to see if you have other thoughts as well. I think, uh, you know, you, you said it very well. Uh, we do have uh, a lot of challenges ahead. And uh, I think from my perspective and the, the people who I have more influence again to, to influence and to get uh, the, the scorecard, the, 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 the measurements in the scorecard, it's to tie in with something that we are already measuring. And it is that makes this not a completely new number, not a completely new process. It's just one more checkbox in that measurement of how we are developing what we are putting in our product and what food are we feeding people because we already have that specific goal that we want to make our our products healthier more nutritious well we are going to make them healthier and more, more nutritious i am hoping with uh mapping out our database and get our baseline and so well we are using this uh, sustainable ingredients to help get those two checkbox so it just makes sense to add this one on Right. So that's where we are, again, going back to leading from where you, you are and starting small with a project that you can actually tie into something people are already comfortable with. One thing I am very into uh, zero waste and uh, I have a friend who I talk a lot about it and she reminds me, you can't expect everyone to do sustainability correctly because you're going to have one or two or 10% of people doing sustainability cor correctly. If you get 90% doing it at 75%, you get a lot more movement than if you get 10 people doing it 100%. So I think that's where we come from starting small and starting from where you stand. On that note, I do just want to point out uh, the approval process, right? Anna and I are not suddenly the CEOs of Griffith Foods. What a wild, wild west that would be. So I would say that for us, um, know that there is, and one of the things that we've found so far in gaining approvals in proceeding with this dashboard is by building it, by having the team engagement, and by having it be data-driven, right? It connects to our purpose, but it provides that data. Uh, that's been really easy selling for us. So if there's a way, and I know Matt mentioned this, but if there's a way to keep connecting it to business results or business performance, I think that makes it really hard for leadership to say, hmm. no, I don't want to move the business forward. And it's one question is, Carrie, how do you manage to lead a new initiative on top of your existing job? These seem like very different hats to wear and possibly conflicting. How do you manage the extra demands on your time? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I promise you I sleep eight hours a night. So for me, it really comes down to prioritization. Um, there's definitely days that I don't think about sustainably sourcing materials. And then there's days that I search in every format that I can and push in every format that I can to source more sustainably. So I think, again, it's finding ways to connect it to your functional role. Um, and quite frankly, I mean, we all know that we're moving towards more of a purpose-driven career path, right? So there's days for me where I'm in meetings for four hours and I need an hour to just get excited about where we're heading in the business strategy. And this does that for me, right? Because it, it fulfills a purpose for me. So um, I would say also don't be shy to lean on your own, on your own purpose, what's fulfilling to you uh, and, and using that to energize you when there's a lot of work on your plate. Okay. One more question, I think. Um, Matt, what is the biggest obstacle that you run into for people trying to get a program like the LST in their organization? And how do you overcome that? Um, you, you're asking how to get a program like ours, the leadership program? Yes, that's what the question is. Yes, yeah, so I think, um, you know, it's it's daunting to start with a clean slate um, with, with something like that. It, it is a pretty complex thing to design a, a program that develops leaders, provides a, you know, a realistic experience and so forth. 
So again, find something and try, you know, try, try it out, you know, maybe put a couple people through it, see how their experience is, try a few different things and see what sticks and what people get the most out of. And then, um, you know, build, build from that. Um, I know even, even the folks at Griffith Foods, they didn't send a hundred people through their first try with our leading the sustainability transformation program. I believe they sent four or five and uh, now they're sending 10. Um, but and we have other organizations that might send one or two and try it out. There's many, many ways of, of developing your skills as a leader. This is just one. Um, find, find what works, but try different things, I'd say. And, um, and, then, and then learn and adjust. It's, it's kind of a theme with, I think, everything we're saying here. You know, do, take small steps, try, do like, say, experiments, right? And learn from them and then adjust. This, well, I, this really sounds like uh, one of the most, the best learnings I've got from the LST course is that there is no right or wrong way to do sustainability. And mm. we are going to mess up quite a few times until we get it right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for adding, add, adding that, Anna. We really do emphasize that. There is no right answer here. Everybody has their own path and you, have, you really have to figure it out. You can't buy the answer from anyone. That's, that's for sure. To keep echoing the, the message from, from my end, it would be tie it to the business, right? So right. LST for Griffith was a fantastic program because there's a direct um, project that comes from this, right? Mm -hmm. So Ann and I built this dashboard program through our time at LST in that program. So I think for us, it was really easy to justify our engagement in the program because we could bring back and say, and, and by investing in this program, the business will have a clear path on how to move forward in sustainability right. in this realm. Um, and so again, the more that you can keep it connected to those business results, there's a reason that we all get to go to work every day, right? Thanks, Carrie. I, I, I wish I'd said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you all. It's been a very interesting discussion. I have had that wonderful feedback from the audience as well. We have recorded this. We will be putting it up and sending it out to everybody. And I'd also like to let everybody know that next month we'll be joined by a couple of engineers from Cummins for a webinar on packaging LCA in the automotive manufacturing industry. So I'd like to thank you all again for joining and good luck on all your sustainability journeys. And uh, I will end this webinar. Thanks, Ollie. Take care, everybody.